I was the first one to be picked up, so they put me in a cell. They locked me in there in this degrading little outfit. Hey, I don't want anybody laughing. Violation of the rules, I'm under lockdown and simulation! Oh, I gotta go to a doctor, anything. Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? screamed so loud in my life. Never been so upset in my life. It was an experience of being out of control. Stanford University, Northern California. One of America's most prestigious academic institutions. And in 1971, the scene of one of the most notorious experiments in the history of psychology. I was interested in what happens if you put good people in an evil place. Does the situation outside of you, the institution, c come to control your behavior? Or does the things inside of you, your attitude, your values, your morality, uh, allow you to, to rise above uh, a negative environment? The negative environment Zimbardo chose to test his ideas was a prison. He would convert the basement of the university's psychology department into a subterranean jail. We put uh, prison doors on each of three office cells. In the cells, there was nothing but three beds, uh, and, and there was very, actually very little room for anything else because they were very small. And here we had solitary confinement, which we call the hole. Uh, and in the hole was, was the place where prisoners would be put for punishment. It was a very, very small area. When you closed the door, it was totally dark. All the guards wore military uniforms, and we had them wear these silver reflecting sunglasses. And what it does is you can't see someone's eyes, and so that loses some of the, the humanness, the humanity. In general, we wanted to create a sense of power. That is, the guards, as a category, are people who have power over others. In this case, power over the prisoners. A decade earlier, psychologist Stanley Milgram had also looked at how we respond to authority. In order to understand how people were induced to obey unjust regimes and participate in atrocities such as the Holocaust, he set up an experiment. Volunteers were told they were taking part in scientific research to improve memory. Would you open those and tell me which of you is which, please? Teacher. Teacher. Separated by a screen, the teacher would ask the learner questions in a word game and administer an electric shock when the answer was incorrect. He was told to increase the voltage with each wrong answer. Cloud, horse, rock, house. Answer, wrong. 150 volts. Answer, horse. Oh. Experiment, that's all. Get me out of here. Get me out of here, please. Continue, please. Go right on. Right. I refuse to go in. Let me out. You refuse to go in. The experiment requires you continue, teacher. Please continue. Participants didn't know that the learner was really an actor, and the so-called shocks harmless. You're going to get a shock. 180 volts. Oh! I can't stand the pain. Let me out of here. Stand I'm not going to kill that man, eh? I mean, who's going to take the responsibility if anything happens to that gentleman? I'm responsible for anything that happens here. Continue, please. All right, next one. Slow. Walk, dance, truck, music. Two-thirds of volunteers were prepared to administer a potentially fatal electric shock when encouraged to do so by what they perceived as a legitimate authority figure. In this case, a man in a white coat. 375 volts. I think something's happened to that fellow in there. Milgram's findings horrified America. They showed that decent American citizens were as capable of committing acts against their conscience as the Germans had been under the Nazis. Like Milgram, Zimbardo was interested in the power of social situations to overwhelm individuals. 
His experiment would test people's responses to an oppressive regime. Would they accept it or act against it? Zimbardo's experiment was conducted against a backdrop of civil rights activism and protest against the Vietnam War. There was a sense of student power, student dominance, and student rebellion against, against authority in general. It was from the student body that Zimbardo selected his participants. After passing tests to screen out anyone with a psychological abnormality, they were paid $15 a day. Each was randomly assigned to the role of guard or prisoner. It was a prison to me. It still is a prison to me. I don't look on it as an experiment or a simulation. It's just a, a prison that was run by psychologists instead of run by the state. I was 20, and that September I was going to college, and it would be nice to have a summer job, but there sure wasn't a lot of time left. And I looked in the want ads, and I found this thing which was just going to fit. It was just two weeks. Once you put a uniform on and are given a job to keep these people in line, you really become that person. Once you put on that khaki uniform, you put on the glasses, you put on, you take the nightstick. I was on summer break from my first year in college and uh, I was looking for a job. Had to choose between that and making pizzas. That sounded like a lot more fun. As well as running the experiment, Zimbardo took on the role of prison superintendent. He began by briefing the guards. I said, you have to maintain law and order. If prisoners escape, the study is over, and you can't use physical violence. You can't create a sense of fear in them. You can't create the notion that their life is totally controlled by us, and that there'll be constant surveillance. We have total power in the situation, and they have none. Prisoners were brought to the basement prison, blindfolded, to confuse them about their whereabouts. They were stripped and deloused. Of course, the guards started making fun of their genitals and humiliating them. And really, it's the start of what's known as the degradation process, which not only prisons, but lots of military-type outfits use that process. When I first got here, even though like, I had to strip when they would call me names, I still didn't feel at all like I was in the prison. I was just looking at it as a job. I recall sort of walking up and down the uh, very short hallway, which was the prison hall, and looking in on the prisoners in there, basically lounging around on their beds. I felt it was like the day in summer camp. The first day I said, this might be a very long, very boring experiment, uh, because it's conceivable nothing will happen. I arrived independently at the conclusion that this experiment must have been put together to prove a point about prisons being a cruel and inhumane place. And therefore, I would do my part you know, to, to help those results come about. I was a confrontational and arrogant 18-year-old uh, at the time, and uh, you know, I said, somebody ought to stir things up a bit here. On the second morning, the prisoners had decided to stir things up as well. The guards found some of them had used their beds to barricade their cell. Prisoner 8612 was one of the ringleaders of the rebellion. Initially, I was stunned. I didn't expect a rebellion because not much happened. I mean, it wasn't clear what they, were, what they were rebelling against, but they were rebelling against the status, rebelling against being anonymous, against um, having to follow orders from, from these, these other students. As punishment for the rebellion, prisoner 8612 was put in the hole, and the guards turned on the other prisoners. The guards felt that they now had to up the ante of being tough. The prisoners made the mistake of beginning to use profanity against the guards in a very personalized way. So not against the guards, but, you know, you little punk, you, you big shit, and so forth. And the guards got furious. Everybody out. Come on. Oh, oh. Well, gentlemen, here it is, time for count. Prisoners were repeatedly woken in the middle of the night. The guards made them do menial, physical tasks and clean out toilets with their bare hands. 
we made it a, a point to not give them any sense of, of comfort or what to expect that it, you know that anything could happen to them at any time including being rousted from their sleep at any hour and forced to stand up in a line and have me hurl insults at them and uh, make them do exercises when you interrupt people's sleep they tend to become a little disoriented and since there was no daylight in the prison they had no idea whether it was night or day I think that I was the instigator of this uh, whole schedule of harassment. The harassment of the guards took its toll on rebellion leader 8612. He told Zimbardo he wanted to leave the experiment. Zimbardo responded not as a psychologist, but as a prison superintendent. I said, well, I can see to it the guards don't hassle you personally. Uh, and in return, all I would like is some information from time to time about what the prisoners are doing. So essentially I'm saying, I'd like you to be a snitch, an informer. And I said, think it over, and if you still want to leave, fine. Confused, prisoner 8612 returned to his cell and told the other prisoners that no one could leave. He believed that we wouldn't let him go, although we've never said that. But the fact that he was the ringleader of the rebellion, and he told the other prisoners, they won't let you leave. And that really transformed the experiment into a prison. I was told that I couldn't quit. And at that point, I just felt totally hopeless. More hopeless than I'd ever felt before. Soon after returning to his cell, prisoner 8612 started showing signs of severe distress. God damn it! You're fucked up! You don't know, you don't know! I mean, God! I mean, Jesus Christ, I'm burning up inside, don't you know? I just fucking can't take it. He came up with a plan that if he acted crazy, we would have to release him. You're so fucked up inside. I feel really fucked up inside. You don't know. I gotta go. I just to a doctor, anything. I can't say that. I'm fucked up. I don't know how to explain it. I'm fucked up inside. Help it out. Help it out now. It starts with make believe, and then he's doing it and cursing and screaming and you know whatever that little boundary is that he 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 moved across. Not that he became really crazy, but uh, he became you know excessively disturbed. I mean, so much so that we immediately said we have to release him. As an experience, it, it was unique. I've never screamed so loud in my life. Um, I've never been so upset in my life. And it was an experience of being out of control. The boundary between reality and make-believe was to become blurred even for Zimbardo. A rumor circulated that released prisoner 8612 would return with friends to liberate the remaining prisoners. I quickly convinced myself that, you know, my most important function was, you know, not to allow this prison liberation to occur, and what can I do to keep my prison going, not the experiment going. The prison was dismantled, and the prisoners moved to another part of the building. Zimbardo waited in the empty corridor, preparing to tell 8612 and his friends that the study was over when a colleague appeared and began asking questions about the scientific basis of the research. I'm trying to get rid of him. Then he says, what's the independent variable? I get furious because he doesn't understand <laughs> that there's a riot about to take place, that this prison is about to erupt. I had totally lost this whole other identity of scientists, researchers, psychologists. The rumored jailbreak never materialized. The guards had dismantled the prison for nothing and had to rebuild it. They took their frustration out on the prisoners. They escalated again the level of control, the level of dominance, the level of humiliating behavior. Eight one nine was the next prisoner to rebel against the harassment of the guards. He barricaded himself in his cell and refused to take part in the count. You're not only not getting a cigarette, for 819's disobedience, the guards made his cellmates do mindless work. This undermined any vestige of solidarity amongst the prisoners, who now chose to accept the tyranny of the guards rather than risk further harassment. That was one of the surprising things to me is that there was so little uh, that the prisoners did to support one another after we started 
our campaign of, you know, divide and conquer. Isolated and distraught, prisoner 819 told Zimbardo he wanted to leave. While I'm interviewing 819 uh, and saying, okay, you know, it's all over, thank you for your participation, you know, I'll give you money for the whole, for the whole two weeks, uh, even though you're leaving early, he hears the prisoners shouting, 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. Prisoner 819 did a bad thing. And he said, I can't leave. And he's crying. And he says, I can't leave. So what do you mean you can't leave? He said, no, I have to go back. Because I don't want them to think you know, that I'm a bad prisoner. And that's, that's when I really flipped out. That in such, a, in such a short time, you know, a college student's thinking could become so distorted. I said, you're not a bad prisoner. You're not a prisoner. And this is not a prison. And it was this thing where he opened his eyes. And it was just really like a cloud being lifted. Seeing things clearly, Prisoner 819 reverted to his original request and was released. To replace him, the experimenters called in one of their reserves from the standby list. I got a phone call saying, are you still available as an alternate? Uh, kind of cheery female secretary voice. I said, yes, sure. And so she said, could you start this afternoon? And I said, yes, sure. And my role in the experiment really began. I was blindfolded and then stripped and supposedly deloused. He came into a madhouse, full blown. All of us had gradually acclimated to the increasing level of aggression, the increasing powerlessness of the prisoners, the increasing dominance of the guards. And he comes in and says, what's happening here to the other prison? And they said, hey, you better not make trouble. It's really terrible. It's a real prison. Uh, and, uh, and he says, you know, I'm out of here, I, I, I don't want to. And they said, no, not, you can't leave. Once you're here, you're stuck. This is a real prison. 416, since you got your hands in the air, why don't you play Frankenstein? 293, you can be the bride of Frankenstein. You stay in here. Prisoner 416 was soon subjected to the harassment of Dave Eshelman, nicknamed John Wayne because of his macho attitude. 416, I want you to walk over here like Frankenstein and say that you love 293. I made the decision that I would be as intimidating, as cold, as cruel as possible. I love you, Joe Nightly. Get up close. Get up close. I love you, Joe Nightly. I love you, Joe Nightly. You smile, Joe Nightly. Who gets out here and do 10 push ups? Two, three. I just watched a movie called Cool Hand Luke, and. Uh, the mean, intimidating, uh, you know, southern prison warden character in that film really was my inspiration for the role that I created for myself. Why did you try to be obedient so much? It's my nature to be obedient. You were a liar. You were a stinking liar. He was creative in his evil. He would think of very ingenious ways to degrade, to demean uh, uh, the prisoners. What if I told you to get down on that floor? One of the best guards was also on that shift, and uh, instead of confronting this bad guard, the sadistic guard, essentially because he didn't want to see what was happening, he became the gopher. He would go out to get the food and, and things of this kind, and that left the John Wayne guard and another guard on that shift to, to be dominant. We were continually called upon to act in a way that just it's contrary to what I really feel inside. It just continually giving out shit. It's just really one of the most oppressive things you can do. 416, while they do push-ups, you sing Amazing Grace. Ready? Down. Oh, baby. Keep going. Grace. You push-ups on your own. The madness of the experiment started to affect Prisoner 416. I began to feel that I was losing my identity until finally I wasn't Clay. I was 416. I was really my number. And 416 was going to have to decide what to do. Prisoner 416 decided to go on a hunger strike. They were pushing my limits, but here was a thing that I could do that could push their limits. 
after I had missed a couple of meals, I saw that this was not a matter of indifference to the guards. I was making headway. They were upset. I thought, how dare this newcomer come in and, and try to change everything that we had worked for the first three days to set up, and uh, by God, he's going to suffer for that. Get in that private van. Frustrated by his continued defiance, John Wayne threw prisoner 416 into the hole. After punishing the other prisoners for his disobedience, John Wayne encouraged them to vent their anger at 416 directly. Thank you, 416. Okay, 209. Thank you, 416. We would use our nightsticks to bang on the door, and we would kick the door so hard that, you know, it must have, you know, shaken <laughs> him very seriously inside, scared the life out of him. He yelled at me and threatened me and actually sort of smashed a sausage into my face to try to get me to open up. But I didn't have any intention of eating until I was out. 416 should have been at some level a hero because he's willing to oppose the authority of the system. In fact, the prisoners accept the guard's definition of him as a troublemaker. I remember some of them saying, you know, would you eat, God damn it? You know, we're sick and tired of this. And, uh, you know, that was proof that, you know, there was no solidarity, there was no support between the prisoners. While 416 was still in the hole, John Wayne made a final attempt to break him by giving his fellow prisoners a choice. They could vote to release him by making a small sacrifice. You can give me the blankets and sleep on the bare mattress, or you can keep your blankets, and 416 will stay in another day. Now, what would it be? What would it be over here? How about 546? I'll give you my blanket, Mr. Gordon, officer. You don't want a blanket. We got three in favor of keeping the blanket. We got three, guess one. Keep your blankets, 416, you're going to be in there for a while. So just get used to it. The study showed that power corrupts and how difficult it is for people who are the victims of abuse to stand up and defend themselves. Why doesn't anybody who is being abused by a spouse or something like that just say stop it? Um, and we realize now that that's not as easy as it sounds. By the end of the fifth day, four prisoners had broken down and been released. 416 was on the second day of his hunger strike, and the experiment still had another nine days to run. At this point, a fellow psychologist visited Zimbardo's basement prison and would witness the brutality of the experiment firsthand. The guards had lined up the prisoners to go to the toilet, had bags over their head, chains on their feet, and were marching by. And I looked up and I saw this, this circus, this parade, and I said, hey, Chris, you know, look at that. I looked up and I just began to feel sick to my stomach. I had this just chilling, sickening feeling of watching this. And I just, you know, I, I just turned away. And I just let loose in this emotional tirade. I just lost it. I was angry, scared. I, I was in tears. And I'm furious. I'm saying, you're supposed to, you know, we had a big argument. You're supposed to be a psychologist. This is this interesting dynamic behavior in such a few days. I'm going through this whole thing, the power of the situation. She says, no, no, it's that young boys are suffering and you are responsible. You're letting it happen. I said, oh my God, of course you're right. The next day, Zimbardo ended the experiment. Studies like his stimulated heated debate about the ethics of using human subjects. Clearly, young men suffered verbally, physically. Prisoners felt shame in their role, guards felt guilt. So in that sense, it's, it's unethical. That is, nobody has the right, the power, the privilege to do that to other people. In the wake of experiments like Zimbardo's and Milgram's, ethical guidelines changed, introducing greater safeguards to protect participants. In the Stanford experiment, Zimbardo might have spared his volunteers distress had he not taken on a dual role in the study. If I was going to be the prison superintendent, I should have had a colleague who was overseeing the experiment, uh, who was in a position to stop it at any point, 
or I should have been the principal investigator and get somebody who was going to be the prison superintendent. I realized that was a big mistake, to play both those roles and be shifting back and forth. After the experiment, Zimbardo brought all the participants together to talk about their experiences. John Wayne would now come face to face with the hunger striker he had tormented. I was a little worried. I said, oh my God, he's really going to come down on me hard now. Uh, now that we're on equal uh, footing. It harms me. How did it harm you? How does it harm you? Just to think it, about it, it, you mean that people can be like that? It, yeah. It let me in on some knowledge that, that I've never experienced firsthand. Uh -huh. Because I know what you can turn into. I know what you're willing to do. When I look back on it now, I behaved appallingly. Um, <laughs> you know, I, it was just horrid to look at. I think I tried to explain to him at the time that, you know, what you experienced and what you hated so much was, was a role that I was playing, that that's not me at all. He was trying to dissociate himself from what he had done. That did make me angry. Everyone was acting out a part and playing a role. Prisoners, guards, staff, <laughs> everyone was acting out a part. Um, it's when you start contributing to the script that's you, and thus it's something you should take responsibility for. Uh, I didn't see where it was really harmful. It was degrading, and that was, that was part of my particular little experiment to see how I could... Uh, Your particular I, little experiment? Yes, Why don't you tell me about that? I was, I was running little experiments of my own. Tell me about your little experiment. Okay. I'm curious. I wanted to, to see just what kind of verbal abuse that people can take before they start objecting, before they start flashing back. If I have any regret right now, it's that, you know, I made that decision because it would have been interesting to see what would have happened had, um, had I not decided to, to force things. It could be that I only accelerated them, that the same things would have happened, uh, but we'll never know. If the extreme nature of Dave Eshelman's behavior tested the prisoners, it also presented the other guards with a choice to intervene or not. It surprised me that no one said anything to stop me. They just accepted what I said, and no one questioned my authority at all. And it really shocked me. Why didn't people, say, when I started to get abused people so much, I started to get so profane that, uh, and still people didn't say anything. There were a few guards who hated to see the prisoners suffer. They never did anything which would be demeaning of the prisoners. The interesting thing is none of the good guards ever intervened in the behavior of the guards who gradually became more and more sadistic over time. We like to think there is this core of human nature that good people can't do bad things and that uh, good people will dominate over bad situations. In fact, one way to look at the Stanford Prison Study is that we put good people in an evil place and we saw who won. Well. The, the sad message is, in this case, the evil place won over the good people. It did show some very interesting and maybe some unpleasant things about human behavior. It, it seems like, you know, every century, every decade that we go through, uh, you know, we're suffering the same kind of atrocities. And uh, you need to understand why these things happen. You need to understand why people behave like this. There's a similar experiment starting this Tuesday night on BBC Two. Details coming up next.